there's only one who can throw the first stone, and that is God himself. And once he starts throwing stones, all those who believe even slightly differently than me, anyone different than myself, better watch out. The Lord above will stone everyone other than us, because we are perfect just like he is. Amen? This is the Bible After Hours. Can you hear me? Is this thing on? Okay, good. I am the Foulmouth Preacher, and this is the Underground Church. The word vulgar originally just meant to speak the common language of the people. That's what Jesus did, it's what the apostles did, the prophets did, and that's what we're going to do here today. So, if you have kids listening, this is not a family show. Uh, we will use stronger language, just like people do out in the world. So, you have been warned. The church above wants to act like they are perfect and like God wants to kill everyone else. And he's just buying time till the end time. You know, he's like one day, he's like, he's not going to kill everybody right now. He, he loves you right now. But one day, he's just going to fucking kill everybody because you guys suck. And that's what the church kind of acts like. Like God's just biding his time. He's waiting it out. And one day he's going to fucking get you. What? What kind of God is that? Just, just a big, he's just pretending to love all of us so that one day he could show us the middle finger, smash us all to bits and say, fuck you guys. Like what? You're just going to burn it all to shit. I don't know that that's not a God that I can get behind. But I, I believed, I believed in that God. I believed in the book of revelation was just this literal telling of the future. Um, you know, I was waiting for God to just come and get everybody who made fun of my beliefs or who made jokes about God. Anyone who was involved in South Park or of another religion, they're all going to fucking burn, right? Like, like that that's what I was waiting on. I was waiting on God to just come kill everyone one day. I was thinking of the end times as this ultimate act of revenge. And I never took the time to reflect on my own sinfulness, how I might need to change how maybe the book of Revelation isn't about how our loving God one day is going to fuck it all up, but rather maybe it's about our loving God warning us so that we don't fuck shit up so bad that it results in that kind of mass death. Maybe our loving God was giving us a warning and not a threat. Maybe he wanted justice and not revenge. I never thought of this, though. Like I was only thinking of this, this he's going to get you, God. And, and I used it to justify myself and to hold on to gripes, right? Like, like I, I wasn't letting go of my anger. I was just kind of channeling it through this, hey, right now, I might want to punch this fucker in the face. I might hate these guys. But, hey, you know what? I'm just going to bitch to God, and one day, he's going to burn them all. And that, that's really how I thought of it and how a lot of people think of it, if they're honest. It's a little bit scary. But that's not how apocalyptic literature works in the Bible. It works a little differently than that. So just like... Today, you might think of comedy films um, having certain tropes, things you expect, They're like a rom-com. You're, you're expecting the girl to fall for the wrong guy, that kind of stuff. And in action films, you expect you know the main star to basically be invincible. Um, if you're familiar with any satirical work, you know that you're not supposed to take it so serious. Um, superhero genre, there's a lot of things you expect in that. So in ancient Eastern times, Near Eastern times, especially in... Um, where Israel was founded, where the Bible was written, they had a lot of books that were called apocalyptic literature, and that genre wasn't, hey, here's what the future's going to be. It was told like that, but the point of it was really to say, if we keep doing what we're doing right now, this is what the future will be. So it's more of a warning. Don't keep doing the dumb shit you're doing, or life will become this shit. Remember, we, we said before when we were going through Judges, shit begets shit. You do shit, you get shit. So apocalyptic literature isn't just foretelling of an angry God fucking everybody up. It's foretelling a, a warning how we might fuck it up if we keep doing what we're doing. So apocalyptic literature is way different than I read it. it it's not, hey, here's what the revenge is going to look like one day. It's, hey, be careful. This is what could happen. Talking to all society, not just telling me you're good, but here's what's going to happen to them. So actually, gonna, It's actually saying... Everyone's in danger, and we need to rethink what we're doing collectively. Guys, we hate self-reflection, especially in America. We think of the word judgment. That makes us think of revenge act, you know, like I was talking about, or, or something bad. You know, if I say, hey, you're going to get judged for that, you never seem to think, oh, that means God's going to look down and smile on me for doing right things. 
you know, judge and judgment, that kind of judgy words have a lot of negative connotation that we make a lot of assumptions about in our own times. Uh, but there's really a positive aspect. When we're looking through the Psalms, like we're doing in the series, you see judgment used to be a good thing. Like, God, please bring your judgment to me. And sometimes it's not saying, it's not only, a lot of times it is saying, if I'm wrong, let me know, God. But it's not only doing that, but it's also saying, hey, I believe I've done right in your eyes. God, judge me so that you might make things right. Since I have been doing right, judgment for me would mean a good thing. So that kind of uh, connotation was different for the word judgment in the Bible. So when we see this in Psalm, that's not just a negative word, and that's something we got to be careful of. C.S. Lewis really explains this well. Um, yeah, you guys know, AMP Network, we're all obligated to mention C.S. Lewis and quote him at least once every couple months or every week, I don't know. So we are going to read a quote from C.S. Lewis about the Psalms before we get into the Psalms today. Um, and he's talking about how the Psalms view judgment. C.S. Lewis says, The ancient Jews, like ourselves, think of God's judgment in terms of an earthly court of justice. The difference is that the Christian pictures the case to be tried as a criminal case, with himself in the dock. The Jew pictures it as a civil case, with himself as the plaintiff. The one hopes for acquittal, or rather for pardon. And that's kind of the Christian thought. It's like we're hoping, not only do we want other people to get you know, slammed and fucked up by God. We're also thinking of ourselves like, I hope that God sees me and he says that I'm not guilty, that he pardoned me for what I am guilty of. Here's the other, the other hopes, this is C.S. Lewis again, the other hopes for a resounding triumph with heavy damages. So the Jewish people aren't just thinking, oh, maybe God will pardon me for my sins. They're also thinking God should give rewards because that's what happens in the civil court is, is rewards are given to those who are in the right. Things are made Right, right. Like those who are in the wrong are taken from and those who are in the right are given something. Think of like a lawsuit. So this is kind of how the, like the Jewish people are thinking about it when they write the Psalms. They're thinking of it as when God brings his judgment, he's going to take from those who have wronged us, from those who have marginalized us and give to the marginalized, those who have done right in God's eyes, who have been belittled unfairly. So God's view, when they think of judgment, they're thinking of God's coming to bring equity where he's going to take those who have been put down and lift them up and take those who have wrongly who have wrongly been lifted up and put them down. So they're thinking of both of those things when they use the word judgment equally. So they believe that God will one day bring equity, punish those who have done wrong, and bring justice to those who have done right. So the church teaches prayers to God uh, about judgment. Usually it's, hey, God, will you delay your judgment? Don't, you know, right now. Or sometimes it's, God, judge the other side so that we might show them that our side's better for thinking like politics and stuff. Sometimes that kind of language gets used. Um, uh, sometimes we pray that we might escape God's wrath, our country might escape his wrath for the wickedness that we've done, that kind of stuff. But we often hear churches teach really specific futures sometimes, um, where this is what the prophecy means, here's exactly what's going to happen, and they kind of break down, and it's like, hey, this represents Russia, and this represents Germany, and you get some really specific prophecies sometimes with like, this is what the prophecies of the Bible meant. And rather than taking it as the kind of literature it is, sometimes it gets taught as, here's how we can use the Bible as a code and we can plug this in and figure out the future. A lot of cults revolve around bad theology and poor teachings of the end times. So a lot of times if you look at like the big cult movements in America, especially and in other countries, you see these cults oftentimes arise from someone saying here's what the book of isaiah meant or here's what revelation meant and they break down the the prophecy and make it about specific things in our world to drive fear into a group and use that to control them and actually create a cult so that's where bad readings and bad theology around the end times in this apocalyptic literature like revelation and daniel can be really dangerous um westminster even uh if you're thinking about the the confession of faith by the west at the westminster is like one of the big not really a creed, but sort of like the Protestant creed. You know, it's where a lot of the stuff about inerrancy of the Bible, the Trinity, stuff that most Protestants, especially evangelicals, hold as like fundamental doctrines comes from this movement in the what this meeting in the Westminster Abbey. Um, but that same meeting calls the Pope an Antichrist or the Antichrist, thinking that, that the Catholics are really showing a, a false belief in God. They're showing all this stuff that's happened in Revelation, and we can look at this and say that that must mean the Pope is the Antichrist. And that's really dangerous rhetoric. A, a lot of the stuff that the Westminster says, I, I'm all for, I love it, but this calling the Pope the Antichrist and trying to make the prophecy fit our times and make it about fear 
in our time. I, I think that's sick, and I think it's wrong. Um, so we're, we're moving ahead in the Psalms, and I, I mentioned last time we're going from Psalm 5 to Psalm 7 today. Um, let's keep in Psalm 6, because I feel like it. Starting at the beginning, and again, we'll do the whole chapter, and then we'll zoom in on a few specifics, and then we'll zoom back out, back out to look at the whole chapter, trying to get all of the details as well as the whole picture without missing anything here. So, Psalm 7. O Lord my God, and you I have taken refuge. Save me from all those who pursue me and rescue me, or he will tear my soul like a lion, dragging me away while there is no one to rescue me. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is injustice in my hands, if I have done evil to my friend, or have plundered my enemy for no reason, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it, and let him trample my life to the ground, and lay my glory in the dust. Selah. Arise, Lord, in your anger. Raise yourself against the rage of my enemies, and stir yourself for me. You have ordered judgment. Let the assembly of the people encompass you, and return on high over it. The Lord judges the peoples. Vindicate me, Lord, according to my righteousness and the, my integrity that is in me. Please, let the evil of the wicked one come to an end, but establish the righteous. For the righteous God puts hearts and minds to the test. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, and a God who shows indignation every day. If one does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and has taken aim. He has also prepared deadly weapons for himself. He makes his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, an evil person is pregnant with injustice, and he conceives harm and gives birth to lies. He has dug a pit and hollowed it out, and he has fallen into the hole which he made. His harm will return on his own head, and his violence will descend on the top of his own head. I will give thanks to the Lord according to the, his righteousness, and will sing praises to the name of the Lord Most High. So looking at the psalm as a whole, the psalm is a request for God to bring his eternal judgment. David even asked God to judge himself and goes into details on the punishment he thinks he deserves if he's done the wrong he's accused of. David has gone through complete shit storms. Some really bad moments, some really bad seasons. Sometimes like we talked about last time, he's gone through stuff that it felt like more than a season, his life. Sometimes his whole life just felt like shit. This time though, David is asking for an end, not to his life, not just to his enemies, He's asking for God to come and make a final judgment, to put to rest who was in the right, who was in the wrong, make a judgment, and just let it be. You see, he humbled himself before God and said, hey, if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, judgment on me. If they're wrong, bring your judgment to them. Bring your judgment and make right the wrongs we both have done, and uplift those who have done right by the righteousness. You know, this is what David's pointing out. He's saying, like, like reward those who've done good, Punish those who've done bad. This is the song of David. Mind you, he's not telling God what to do. He's not saying this is what God will do. This is, like, again, yeah, it's it's descriptive, not prescriptive. So this is his heart, what he wants. And, and I believe, you know, the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. I feel like this is pretty close. Like, maybe God's not wanting to murder people who did wrong. You know, he is a God of love. But I, I think there is this sense where God wants equity. He wants rights to be rewarded, wrongs to be punished. So let's look at some of these details again, zooming in on a couple different verses. First, looking at this. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is injustice in my hands, if I have done evil to my friend, or have plundered my enemy for no reason, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. And let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Salah. So again, David humbles himself. He's asking God to pass judgment on me. If I'm wrong, God, come let something happen to me. How often are we willing to be judged and open to the idea that maybe, maybe I am wrong. Maybe I've done this thing. Maybe I've stolen from someone unjustly. Maybe I've, you know, lied to a friend. Maybe I've cheated. Maybe I am the one who is deserving of judgment. How often are we really willing to ask that about ourselves and ask God of that about ourselves? Usually it's not that often, but I, but I think, man, that kind of reflection, it's not, not only is it powerful, I think it's good. And it shows David's heart. David is desperate for an end. Even if it shows that he's in the wrong, he just wants it to end. All right, looking ahead a little bit here, a few other verses. Arise, Lord, in your anger. Raise yourself against the rage of my enemies and stir yourself for me. You have ordered judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples encompass you and return on high over it. The Lord judges the peoples. David's picturing here a God in the skies, right? He's saying, 
you know, you are judging over your the judges, the people, um, the, you know, uh, it's this clear image of God in the heavens looking down, judging people. It's, it's not a guy that I believe in, but this is the God he's talking about. He's talking about a transcendent God, but a just God who's going to put everyone on equal grounds like he's vindicating from on high. But a little bit further, speaking of vindicate, vindicate me, Lord, according to my righteousness and my integrity that is in me. Please let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. For the righteous God puts hearts and minds to the test. So David doesn't mean like, he's, he's not saying I'm righteous in the sense that he thinks he's done no wrong. He doesn't think himself perfect as God's perfect. Um, the tone of the rest of the psalm really clarifies this, right? Like he, if he thought he was completely in the right and perfect, he wouldn't be like, God, if I am wrong, come and get me. Uh, rather, David believes that God's going to judge that he is innocent of what he's being claimed that he's done and that God will deliver justice. So David in the psalm, he's like, hey, if I fucked up, let me know I fucked up. But in this instance, what they're accusing me of, I believe that I'm innocent. God, if I am, show everyone. Let your judgment be known. So also you see here the word, it says, it says uh, hearts and minds. Um, it, it says God, for the righteous God puts hearts and minds to the test. Uh, that word, hearts and minds, is a singular word in the Hebrew that it's really more heart and kidney is usually what it means. Um, and it kind of denotes every part of the man, all of his being is going to be put to the test. The righteous, for the righteous, God puts all of the mankind to the test, all of a person. The article in the Hebrew here also should be translated a righteous God. So it's not for the righteous God. It's actually for a righteous God, if you're, if you're just translating it directly. And I think that's meaningful. You know, in, in our language, that kind of denotes, oh, maybe he's saying there's other gods, because why would he say a God? But in the Hebrew, he, he's using a to kind of depict that God as being empathetic, God who is an understanding God. He's putting all of us to the test with compassion, with understanding. Um, you know, he, he's an empathetic God. Right? Looking at a few of the other verses. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, and a God who shows indignation every day. If one does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and taken aim. He has also prepared deadly weapons for himself. He makes his arrows fiery shafts. So the sword and the bow here, they're meant to show that uh, you can't, whether you're far, whether you're close, you can't escape the justice of God. God will make things right. This section of scripture also uses both the, section of scripture also uses both the plural and the singular words for God. So you have El, singular God, and Elohim, God. And this is meant to show that God is both transcendent God, the one who sits above looking down, passing judgment, but also the imminent God, the one who is in all things, who is working with us to pass that judgment and to make justice come to pass, right? All right. Again, we're going to look at another verse here. I will give thanks to the Lord according to his righteousness, and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. The psalm begins and ends with Yahweh as the first and last word. Um, so here it says Lord Most High. The way the Hebrew works, it would basically, it would say Most High Lord, the Most High Lord would kind of be more accurate. And then, you know, the first word is Lord. Um, Lord my God, I think is how the phrase would begin in the beginning. Um, and, and this is to note that this psalm of final judgment, the psalm of like the end times, of like the end, God ended, is what God, David's singing and praying for here. And he ends it and he begins it with the name Yahweh, the name of the Lord. Because everything that happens within this verse, he wants to be encompassed. He wants his whole prayer to be encompassed in the name of God. The psalm, it, it, it's just, it's powerful. When you put everything in perspective, of God's name, of his righteousness, of his, like like just how big God is. And you're putting this request for judgment and, and justice in that context. It makes it all the more powerful and all the more humbling when you think of what David says about even his own self asking for judgment. Psalm's another one that uses a chiastic structure. So, you know, I mentioned we're going to look back at the whole picture. So we looked at, zoomed in, we looked at a few of these verses. Look, Looking at the whole picture again, you see that chiastic structure. Um, so beginning and then the last thing, and, you know, they reflect, and then the second to the last thing and the second thing in the chat, you know, reflect until there's only one thing in the middle and the thing in the middle is the main point, right? So if you notice, we said the psalm, it, it begins and ends with Lord Most High, God's great. After that, w so after that you have um, the second thing is, hey, my enemies are coming to get me, God. And then the second to last thing is the enemies let their own ways punish themselves. So they're going to get themselves. So you see that little bit of uh, parallelism. After that, you have David asking, God, if I'm wrong, judge me. And then the parallel part of that is, if they're wrong, judge them. 
But then the thing in the middle, the main point, so he's, all these things are like surrounding the main point and, and they're paralleled and poetic, beautiful, if you're thinking of like what David's heart is here asking for justice. What is the thing that's in the middle? It's about God. Again, the middle of the ver- the chapter, it, it, once more, it's God. He says, my shield is with God who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who shows indignation every day. The main point is that God wants justice and that God, it, it doesn't, he's not a regarder of persons. He's not saying, oh, I like these people more. The Israelites are my people, so I'll, you know, I'm going to be good to them, but not the others. No, God wants equity. God wants justice. He's going to cast down those who are wrong and uplift those who are right. Equity, justice. These are the things of God. These are the things that David was praying for and singing to God about. He was singing about social justice, even if it meant he was the one that needed to be punished. And I believe that's an important thing for us to take away. You know, again, this isn't prescriptive of how we should be, but I think this is its a beautiful psalm, and it's something that, that the heart of it is something that I think should be in the heart of all of us who follow God. And we're to pray for and pursue equity and justice. You know, we don't want revenge where God just goes and fucks them up at the end, right? Like, that's not what we need. We don't need revenge where God just comes and fucks it all up at the end. And, hey, God, go get our revenge because we're mad about what they said about us. It's bullshit. Not just bitching to God. It's asking God for, for true justice. For him to truly make things equal. To make things fair as only God can. So we don't need revenge. We don't need to hope that everyone will be just like us. Just as much. It is just as much about holding ourselves up to God's standards as it is asking for justice. Realizing, I fall short. And what do I need to do to be better? David Hart is right to ask for justice. Often he asks God to just beat up the bad guys. But here, David asks, if I'm a bad guy, bring justice still. Even if it's me who's in the wrong. Equity and justice, it, it can cost us something sometimes. It's not always in our favor. Sometimes we're the ones who fucked up. And we got to get shit for it. Sometimes, in order to make things fair for another, we have to put ourselves, we have to favor them over ourselves. You know, sometimes those who are marginalized, they need a leg up. And it's our duty. You know, we talked about how there's the word both for the transcendent God, El, and then the Elohim, that God who is with us, that plural sense of God. And we have to work with God to see that justice come through. And sometimes that means lifting others up over ourselves, those who have been marginalized, those who have been put down, those who have not been given the same opportunities as us, lifting them up, especially the righteous. When someone does something good at work or at church, not taking credit for it, but making sure others see what good others have done. Judgment isn't just, go get the bad guys. It isn't just, God, go fuck them up. It's, hey, if I'm wrong, punish me. If they're wrong, punish them. If I have done righteousness, God please reward me for it. I mean, that's a fair thing to pray. You know, sometimes we ask, we act afraid to ask for God's favor. You know, sometimes it's okay. It's a good thing. And also to ask God's favor on others who have performed justly and are living righteously. And to help ensure that that favor is shown to others by extending our own hands, doing what we can to see things to come to fruition for justice sake, for equity. If we are not just hoping that the baddies get beat up, that we're not just hoping that other people get punished for their shit. And what does justice look like? Do we put the privilege down to make things more equal? Or do we only raise those up who are less fortunate? How can wrongs be equalized? Not just social justice, but what does equity look like for thieves, for murderers, or e- even for tax fraud, adultery, lying, like, like real wrongs? You know, not just like those who have been marginalized, but what about people who really fucked up? What does equity look like for them? What does restoration look like for them? What about people who suffer from addiction, anger, lust, who are, who are like, they, they don't want to be this way, but they are this way, and those things are bad. What does equity look like for them? What does restoration, what does justice look like for those people? We must ask for, we must ask for penance for our wrongdoings and go and make things right for the shit that we've done. We have to ask for penance for the wrongdoings of others, that things be made right. We have to look to find ways to lift those up who've suffered from social injustice, look to find ways to help restore those who've suffered from anger, lust, addiction, those kind of things. We have to help We have to find ways to help those who need to be restored, help those who need social justice to see equity in their own time, where they're no longer marginalized, but put on equal footing as everyone else. That's what justice, that's what equity looks like, and that's the heart of God, and it's the heart of this psalm. If we begin to ask for penance, if we begin to do 
things to make things right, if we begin to figure out how to get involved in our own communities to uplift the marginalized, if we figure out how to go and volunteer at uh, addiction centers and, and figuring out what we can do to help those who've suffered to be restored to what we got to do. And if we do, the world can begin to achieve fairness. Maybe it won't be excellent, but maybe we can get a little bit closer to just fair. We'll see the marginalized lifted up. Addicts will begin to be restored. Freedom to live their lives once more. The wrongs of our society will be corrected as we begin to take action. Because I don't want you to share this on your public social media accounts if you think it might offend someone. If you think you could share it without offending people, please do. You know, every share, every like, rating, all that stuff, it, it helps algorithms find the show. And, and I think we have something important to say here. I would love for more people to find this show. But I don't want anyone to be offended. That's not why we do this. So don't share this if you think it might offend someone. Rather, share it with a friend or a family member or a single person who you think might benefit from hearing this. They might be willing to engage in you a conversation of what we can do to see justice and equity in our own time. Let's bring the church back to the common people. Thank you for listening.